Well, welcome everybody. It's Friday afternoon and it's the second last session of Families Day and, and uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here this afternoon. My name's Liz Waters. I'm the Jack Brockhoff Chair of Child Public Health within the university and I lead a program on child health and wellbeing. So it's particularly delightful that this afternoon's focus is on how we increase the participation of children in society in everything we do. And we have a wonderful panel of speakers uh, uh, for you this afternoon. I would like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional custodians of the land upon which we're gathered this afternoon and pay, their, pay my respects and our respects to their elders past and present. The, as part of the festival, we've been putting together a wonderful bundles nest, which is just outside, and I really encourage everybody to uh, participate, to write their hopes and dreams and contribute to the bundles nest, and, and it will be a perpetual gift uh, to the university and, and here for us to enjoy for a very long time. Throughout the Festival of Ideas, we've been using the Twitter hashtag uh, hash UOMFOI, so we encourage you to turn down your mobile phones but to keep your mobile phones on and enjoy and participate as a live audience through Twitter. And Mike Flatley, as Deputy Director of the program here in the front row, will be feeding in some of those Twitter questions as they come through for the panel discussion later on. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Nairi Brown. Welcome, Nairi. Uh, Nairi is Executive Manager uh, and PHMO Research for National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation. She was one of the first Aboriginal medical graduates in Australia. She's a woman, a uh, UN Nation woman from the south coast of New South Wales and is passionate about Indigenous health and social justice. She was Foundation Chief Executive Officer with the Aboriginal Indigenous Doctors Association, and during her career, Nari has held a variety of positions in education, mentoring, clinical practice, and advocacy. Welcome, Nari. I love how my introductions always make me sound a lot more interesting than I actually am. Um, but Gamarara Mitigar Gurungburuk, uh, welcome. A friend is happy to see you. And I bring respects from my mob, the UN Nation from the south coast of New South Wales, to the traditional custodians upon whose beautiful country we're able to gather and discuss and debate, debate and to learn from one another. Uh, but also my respects to each of you uh, and to the organisers and of course the lovely um, and saucy Professor Fifi Stanley uh, for allowing me to uh, be able to participate. The challenge of course for me is to uh, try and cram um, uh, a lot of what will be seemingly random thoughts into about 10 minutes, so please bear with me. Um, how am I doing there, darling? Sensational. So my interests are largely twofold. So uh, child and adolescent wellbeing, so obviously Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mob, but also Indigenous peoples across the Pacific and beyond. Um, and how we look at building the evidence base that demonstrates that a better connection to culture and understanding where you're from, where your country is, who your people are, what your stories are, uh, then helps us to have a better sense of self and identity and then improves our outcomes across the social determinants of health and how we build that base. And looking at novel vehicles for cultural revitalisation, and it's, it's interesting that Whilst there are the obvious choices around art, music and sport, for example, as vehicles, um, I was recently in Taiwan and gave presentations to the um, Academy of Science and uh, the topic was science curriculum um, and curricula in Indigenous education, but also Indigenous science in education and what that means. And I also gave a presentation on culture and biobanking, so looking at genetic and genomic research and how culture and cultural imperatives and better understanding Indigenous peoples broadly will actually allow us to engage in the great sort of scientific frontiers. And just um, with that love, look at that smiling, beautiful face, a little jar gem there, you just want to nyo their cheeks. <laughs> if we look at culture and cultural education and what we're terming as the cultural determinants of health, um, and whilst we've been banding that about for, for quite some time, we've looked recently at some of the dimensions of the, um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and looking at some of the thematic groupings of the articles within the Declaration. So around the right to self-determination, um, being able to stay, live and grow on country, um, being able to participate in your own decision making 
making, but privileging Indigenous knowledges and practices all as part of those themes. We know through, say, the work of Chandler and Lalonde, but also the Watcher stuff uh, from Western Australia, and the work of both um, beautiful, intelligent, um, saucy group of both Indigenous and non-Indigenous researchers, and of course our community members, that dimensions of cultural understanding and connection actually improve our outcomes across the social determinants, particularly education, health, employment and social function. And so when our kids have a better sense of self and identity, they are better able to be engaged, um, they are more resilient and we can measure that. And then they have a greater sense of um, health and well-being, and then they're able to better contribute to society broadly. Does that kind of make sense thus far? And then, of course, in the in the child protection space, so looking at what has already been sort of built around the public health and responsive regulation um, perspectives, but then adding an additional dimension that I'll, I'll uh, come to in a moment um, around capacity, and, and in particular community capacity and the workforce capacity to be able to provide and then promote safe environments for the growth and development of our children. And uh, this, you know, some people find this... Um, um, challenging perhaps, but you know, the social campaign, particularly in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, where we promote zero tolerance for child sexual and physical abuse. Because as far as I'm concerned, one case is one too many. Now that's possibly a, a much larger aspiration than I will ever live to see fulfilled. But I don't, I, I don't step away from those sorts of bold predictions. And if we don't work towards something that's outrageous, then perhaps we'll never be there. So my sort of participation, I used to say I'm a jack of all trades, master of none, but I've been told I'm not allowed to say that. So professionally and personally, I tend to do a lot of different things, let's put it that way. So everything from genomic and genetic sort of research engagement um, through to human rights and United Nations stuff, uh, and I, I'm a clinical practitioner as a bit of a hobby, I suppose. But one of the other Aboriginal doctors put it to me one time, he said, look, there are many of us who have come from the same communities or in fact from the same families. Some of us do really well and others don't do so well. Why is that? And just over the course of you know conversations and coffees and perhaps a few beers back in the day, you know, one of the things that we identified was that we knew who we were as Aboriginal people. So irrespective of our colour, our community, our geography, our cultural practice, if we were better connected to self, so culture, self, and we had better outcomes or what we saw to be better outcomes. And so my interests are around those connections between culture, resilience and well-being, and particularly in a space for, for children and adolescents. And it connects all of that sort of diverse work, so whether it's genetic research or clinical practice or education. So there are a number of activities that are kind of unfolding from the, that particular thread or those themes or those perspectives. And so we're looking at developing a youth healing centre in Western New South Wales, looking at at-risk and vulnerable adolescents, uh, young men at this particular time. And so we'll take referrals from schools, uh, community health centres, from the justice system, so providing diversionary but also early release opportunities, for example. And at the heart of it, we're going to provide cultural education for them and help them reconnect to who they are and where they're from. We will wrap around that all of the so-called mainstream sort of curriculum um, activities, because Auntie Nice says if you're between 12 and 18 or 12 and 17, you should still be at school. And then we'll try and build their social capabilities. So when we release them into the wild, it's actually back into community or back to school or back into the vet sector or uni or into the community where they will feel that they are part of that. Hopefully developing a network of cultural immersion schools, so very similar to the models that we see in Aotearoa or in Hawaii or Canada or mainland US, where it's very much at the heart, it's about learning your language, your ceremony, your cultural practice um, and being able to take that forward because it's something that you are incredibly proud of and part of your narrative and your story. None of the, the deficit model, but where are our strength-based approaches and they come from culture and sense of self. And, you know, why not build a network that might be like, you know, the, the, the so-called alternative schools like the Steiner schools? And in particular, I, what I wanted to, to chat about is some of the child protection initiatives that through my work, particularly with Nacho, and we're the peak body for the community controlled health, Aboriginal community controlled health services in Australia, and we have about 150 of those. So using them as a network and hubs to build the child protection and child safety network. Uh, so workforce, but also just in terms of general education, community support, and promoting the message that 
Child sexual and physical abuse has never been part of our culture. And I reject that outright. And anybody who tells you otherwise, that tells you that child sexual abuse in Aboriginal communities was culturally relevant, is a liar, and you can tell them to come and speak to me. Um, we're working with Professor Judy Atkinson, who's developed a, um, um, a number of um, modules of qualifications, for example, that hopefully we'll be able to use to train up um, sure, doctors and nurses, but in particular our Aboriginal health workers. So we have this um, competent um, and culturally competent as well as clinically competent workforce uh, for child and adolescent safety and wellbeing um, and that they'll be available around the country. How am I doing for time there, boss? So a lot of you will be aware of the public health and responsive regulation sort of approach to child protection, for example, and looking at policy and practice in that space. And so when you look at primary prevention, so very much a prevention model, it's about public education and awareness. It's about empowering communities to champion, I hope, the zero tolerance approach. Um, where secondary prevention is about being able to better identify the at-risk children and their families, but also communities. Um, be able to prepare and, and utilise culturally valid and validated tools for assessment. Uh, coordinate um, diverse portfolios. So as you know, this isn't all about health, it's not all about justice, it's not about law. Um, education, public health, um, teachers, police officers, Every member of the community is responsible for creating safe environments. Um, and tertiary uh, prevention is about recovery and rehabilitation for, uh, for families and children and communities that have been affected, but also about increasingly intensive regulatory and legislative intervention. But one of the dimensions we don't do particularly well, say, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander environments uh, is, the, um, is the third dimension uh, around capacity development. And so I'd really like to look at how we build capacity, but from a culturally relevant and positive perspective that acknowledges Indigenous intellectual property and traditional practices, particularly around parenting and child and child rearing. So if we look at communities and families, it's about bonding, it's about raising our children and having that valued and validated. It's about reducing risk factors wherever possible, um, in improving access to support and other services, um, but also for all professions, but all individuals within the community to be able to better identify and then act when they think that there is something that's not quite right in terms of child safety. Uh, childhood development issues, so particularly mastery and resilience, uh, looking at supporting positive adolescent transitions, and also some of those innate um, the qualities that our young people possess. Creating safe environments for growth and development, so you know your social, sports, school environments, but also everything extending to say urban planning or things we wouldn't normally think of. I've talked about workforce development uh, and also touched on some of the legislative um, controls and interventions because as we know, federation is the gift that keeps on giving and there's a lot of inconsistencies and I think confusion in this space. So how do we rationalise some of that and bring it together and uh, for enactment through each of the states and territories so that we're not losing our children in that system and we're actually intervening at, at points that are appropriate and timely. Now, I'm getting a bit sort of anally retentive in my old age, and so rather than the flight of ideas, I try to conceptualise things or order them so that I know what the hell I'm supposed to be talking about. So if we look at some of the domains, um, the principles and the actions that we might be able to address in Aboriginal child protection, for example, I prioritise the cultural perspective. So how do we privilege, as I've mentioned, Aboriginal knowledge um, and use that as a foundation for a strength-based approach? Um, when we look at the political agenda, the safety of children and their protection from sexual abuse should be a non-negotiable social priority. When we look at policy and practice, the best interests of the child should be at the very heart of our decision making and how we determine systems, but also allowing them a voice um, which acknowledges their evolving capacity. So, you know, in the immortal words of Dr. Zeus in Horton, Here's a Who, um, a person's a person no matter how small. Um, does that mean one minute? So, in my one minute, what's the relevance of all of these different threads? And I think that, for me, it's important that we are able to capture and then apply um, the positive cultural foundations to all of our activities in child and adolescent wellbeing, including child protection and safety, that we privilege positive cultural practices. And in terms of the proposition, and I know this might seem completely random, but it, 
it was one way that I thought I may be able to distill a, a lot of random ideas into a single recommendation that we can take forward. So a lot of the other requires broad interdisciplinary and collaborative um, effort as does all that we do. Um, but perhaps the one thing that the festival can uh, promote is that we look at rationalising Commonwealth or national legislation in the child protection space and then allow each of the states and territories and their so-called autonomy to be able to, to then enact that um, so that we can provide environments that grow our children strong and make them proud that they're Aboriginal. Gamarana. Thanks, Nari, and clearly I need to be a bit more subtle with my timing. So for the next speakers, I'll just be going like this. I'm very uh, pleased to welcome Professor Lawrence Goston, Larry, uh, to, as he is well known. Larry is a university professor and director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University in the US. He's a, also a fellow at the University of Oxford and the Claude Leon Foundation Distinguished Scholar at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. He directs the World Health Organization Collaborating Center on Public Health Law and Human Rights and serves on the Director General's Advisory Committee on Reforming the WHO. Larry was the recipient of the Public Health Law Association's Distinguished Lifetime Achievement Award, the Rosemary Delbridge Memorial Award in the UK, and the Tohoku University Distinguished Medal for Human Rights in Mental Health. He also drafted the Model Emergency Health Powers Act to combat bioterrorism after, after the September 11th attacks. Welcome, Larry. It's great to have you here and look forward to your presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Fiona Stanley, for inviting me. This is my favorite place on earth. Uh, Rob Moody, who some of you know, calls me Melbourne Larry because when I'm in Washington, I'm a grumpy old man and I come here and I can't stop smiling. Um, so I'm really uh, hap happy, happy um, to be here. Uh, I'm going to uh, cover three areas from the perspective of the human rights of the child. Um, the first is I'm going to tell you two stories um, f that children told me uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and in the Blackfeet Reservation, um, uh, American Indians uh, in Montana. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the universal rights of the child. Uh, and finally, I'm going to apply it just briefly to Australia so that you don't think it's all the way over there are the problems and not here. Um, so I, I've got a book coming out on global health law at, at, from Harvard University Press. And instead of having a, you know, a great person like Fiona write the preface, we decided to have what we call global health narratives, the stories that children tell themselves from around the world. And I'm just going to give you two little snippets of many stories that uh, were told to me. Um, Nama Biru, uh, is, his story was uh, from uh, uh, a, a suburb, Gaba, in uh, uh, Kampala, Uganda. Uh, I'm first born out of a family of seven children. Each child has his or her own mother, but was born of the same father. My mother has two children, a boy and a girl. I stay in a very rowdy place with no clean water, no good toilets or bathrooms. The toilets are all shared. I have to move a long distance every day looking for clean water to bathe and cook. At night, the conditions worsen. There's hardly electricity. The mosquito noise fills the place. Cockroaches move about me and make me sick. Even when I fall ill, I have nowhere to go to the hospital. My mother, who would have helped me, lives in a village far away because she has HIV AIDS. And because of this, um, she can't live here in Kampala because she has no job and no access to care. She needs money to try to help to pay for our school fees. Life is so hard and complicated for me. I have to cook food for my brother and myself. 
My father gives my stepmother money to, se to send to me, but I rarely, if ever, get it. And when I request him to send it directly, he does not. This forces me to cook one meal a day, for I lack money to access all the food I would need to get healthy. A lot of violence happens to us, especially the girls. We're always raped and our property is stolen. I hope and pray that one day I'll be able to leave home and that I will be able to finish school. I do not want to go back to my father's home. I want to find a job and begin a new life and look after my mother and sibling. And then I want to tell the story of Molly. Um, she's a young girl in the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana. I start my days with a cup of joe, then corral, ride, break horses. I smoke a bowl of weed about six or seven times. Whenever I have it, I smoke whatever I can to relieve my stress. My father used drugs, snorts cocaine in front of me, taking my birthday money. He even did a line of coke with me and he used alcohol since I was born. My dad was abusive to all of us. He was verbally abusive and I watched my father beat my sister with a belt. It was not spanking, but he beat her and he backhanded me. Drugs have made me a hermit. I try to stay away from Browning, small town in Montana, because I'm trying to stay sober, but whenever I go there, my friends force me to drink and I'm trying to get high whenever I can. I have friends who smoke bad drugs in front of their kids, meaning meth. Then they try to take care of their kids. They touch them, they hold them, and I wonder if the smoke affects those kids. I've walked into the house and there were many people smoking meth, and it's like, hey, don't you know there are kids around? If I could, I would turn our reservation dry and stop all the drugs. When I was at the Blackfeet Reservation, there were some astounding things. Where the children were playing, it was filthy, and they were dumping raw sewage into a lagoon. Do you know a child born in uh, the Blackfeet Reservation? Something like 57% of them grow, are born addicted to a, to a substance. And their life expectancy at birth for a male is 48 years old. And right next door, in a wealthy town in Montana, roughly double the life expectancy, when nearly that. These are fundamental violations of human rights that really are unspeakable, and we don't even think about it here in Melbourne or New York or Washington uh, or London. Um, but these are everyday occurrences in people's lives. Um, but the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child forbid it. And in fact, this is universal right, the right of the child. In fact, only two countries in the world have not ratified the convention, Somalia and another broken country. Oh, yes, the United States. <laughs> so what the convention says is children have the right to an adequate standard of living, health care, education, and services and to play and to recreate. That is, each child has the right to grow up living a healthy life with an adequate standard of living, being educated, and the right to play and to enjoy a, a, a young life. These include a balanced diet, a warm bed to sleep in, and access to schools without fees. And there are protections that children have or ought to have. As Nare said, children have the right to protection from abuse, neglect, exploitation, both physical and sexual, and discrimination. These rights include the right to safe places for children to play, constructive child-rearing behavior, and acknowledgement of the evolving capabilities of every child. They also have the right to, be, to participate. Children have the right to participate in their communities and have programs and services. In other words, they need to have all the conditions necessary to meet human needs, food, shelter, education, health care. Do you know, I work in global health, and one of the things that astounds me is that one of the key issues in global health 
is how to get a child to reach five years old. Isn't that horrible? That, we, that, that is the minimal goal we have, is to try to reach five years of age. And it would be so simple. We don't need a lot of money. We don't need advanced technologies. To get a child to five, you need safe birth attendance for the mother. You need clean food. You need nutritious, uh, clean water, nutritious food. You need to protect the child against malarial or dengue mosquitoes. When the child gets an infection, the child needs antibiotics. The most basic, simple thing. Every child has the right to reach five, but more than that, every child has the right to a healthy development. And so my general prop proposition is simply that all children have the right, the human right, um, to have a fair opportunity for a healthy and safe life without abuse and with the nurturing that every child deserves. And that the Australian government should increase its assistance, domestic and international, to ensure that every child has a fair opportunity for a healthy lifespan. I didn't have the time to tell you about Australia, but if in the questions you ask me, it's not only over there, it's also here. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Larry, very much. Our next speaker is Emeritus Professor Dorothy Scott. Uh, Dorothy is, was the Foundation Chair of Child Protection and the inaugural director of the Australian Centre for Child Protection at the University of South Australia until her retirement in 2010. She's had a very distinguished career and a very real applied career in social work in Victoria uh, and in South Australia. She's taught at the University of Melbourne. And during her time as a senior social worker, Dorothy helped establish specialist services for women experiencing postpartum psychiatric disorders and services for women and children who'd been sexually assaulted. Since the 1980s, she's conducted numerous reviews and inquiries in Australia in the field of child protection and served on the ministerial advisory bodies in several states and territories. Welcome, Dorothy. Thank you, Liz. It's an honour to be here, friends, one and all. I tried to retire recently, as you just heard, came back to Melbourne, got reacquainted with my dear old friend, The Age, and soon found that the first pages I turned to were the obits and the death notices, and as Nares just said to me, if your name's not there, it's a good day. <laughs> but I did come across one beautiful gem in the death notices. Pa. Didn't we have some fun? As a boy, you took Kari and me for rides on bulldozers, tractors and the timberjack, and you taught us so much around the farm, working with you, stacking timber, feeding the animals, tractor work, and right up to recent times gardening or just polishing your car. It was satisfying to hear you say beauty, knowing I did a good job for you. That resonated with me in the same way that my favourite quote does from Heyman and Mead, that the task of the family, like the task of humanity, is to remember those who've gone before, to cherish the living and to prepare for those not yet born. Did children today still do things for grandparents like that, I wondered? Well. I wasn't sure about that. Had the roles of children as consumers and clients completely eclipsed the role of children as contributors in contemporary Western society? And is being a contributor beneficial to a child's well-being? Well, I started having a hunch about this as my partner Alan and I were up with the friends of the Helmeted Honey Eater trying to regenerate the bush for the 60 or so individual birds of this critically endangered species that still survive in the wild at Yellingbo. And there one day with the children from Yellingbo Primary School, we were planting trees. And I looked at those children's faces and they radiated with joy. So I had a hunch 
But what did the literature say? What did the research say? Well, the positive psychology literature talks about, for adults, being part of something larger than oneself, having meaning. And the World Health Organization definition of mental health says this, a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Yet in the fields with which I'm most familiar, child protection, juvenile justice, child and adolescent mental health, we exclusively focus on children as clients. And in the wider community, we reduce them to consumers. So where are children and young people as contributors in our communities? In some schools, like Stephanie Alexander's school kitchen program. But how many and how successfully? I'd seen young people as contributors in one place, in a remote Aboriginal community in Anangu, Pichanjara, Yankanjara lands, an area with severe child malnutrition. And very expensive things had been tried, evacuating the young adolescent mother and her infant to Alice Springs, short-term success, return home, wait faltering again and again. And then I witnessed one Aboriginal woman, Brenda Stubbs, try something different. And she, with her own hands, prepared a place that would be welcoming to these young women and their children. And she fed them and had a conversation and invited them to work several hours a day creating meals for the elderly folk in that community for pay. And then they would stop at the end of the morning. They would feed their children, feed themselves, and take home what was left over. And in a few months, those young women stopped being the bad mothers of the skinny kids and became respected contributors to their community. She invited them as guests, not as clients. And she invited all the young mothers, not just those that had skinny children. And she used the Pigeon Jara concept of Napaji Napaji, I give to you, you give to me. Drawing on her indigenous knowledge. Does that have anything to do with mainstream society in this country? I think so. Because since the Industrial Revolution, the unit of the family has shifted from being a unit of production to a unit of consumption. And children have become prime consumers within that unit of consumption. Does it matter, you might say? I think it does. And there are two landmark studies that tell us it does. One is the work of Glenn Elder, US sociologist, and author of the book, Children of the Great Depression. He reanalyzed data of two birth cohorts, children born in 1920 to 1921, and children born 1928 to 29. He compared children in families that had suffered a significant loss of income in the Depression compared with those who hadn't. And for very young children, he found what we would expect, that very young children were seriously affected by the family's poverty. But he found the reverse with the adolescents. Why? Well, his explanation is that the status enhancing responsibilities adopted by the adolescents in the financially strained families was a source of self-efficacy and social competence. He had similar results when he did research in the Iowa farm crisis in the 1980s and 1990s. The second researcher is Emmy Werner the mother of resilience research. And she has shown us that required helpfulness and active engagement in ways of helping others is a critical part of child resilience. The eminent child psychiatrist and Quaker, Professor Michael Rutter, has said this about that. It seems desirable that we foster personality development in such a way that our children are cooperative and pro-social, not because they feel they have to be so, but rather because they get pleasure from being so. I closed my eyes and thought again of the children in Yelling Bow. It was pleasure on their faces. Adam Phillips, a British psychoanalyst, and Barbara Taylor, a historian, in their beautiful little book on kindness, have said, the child who is failed, failed in the opportunity to give to others, is robbed of one of the greatest sources of human happiness. Are we robbing our children of one of the greatest sources of human happiness? 
Is caring for others central to being part of something larger than ourselves? Could it be in part an antidote to the corrosive consumerism of contemporary culture for children and adults alike? How about a big national action research with the emphasis as much on the action, action research initiative led by an organisation such as the Australian Research Alliance for Children and Youth, which Professor Stanley led, which involved children and young people as equal co-researchers, exploring questions like, what are the opportunities in families and in communities for children to contribute in ways that give them pleasure? Are intrinsic and extrinsic rewards important? How does gender and cultural difference shape caring behaviour? What about children who are not pro-social? Does adolescence change the pattern of caring behaviour? These are really important questions we do not yet have the answers to. The local results of such a national action research project could be co-presented by the mother of the nation, Professor Fiona Stanley, to the Prime Minister in our parliament in Canberra so that this nation could hear the vision of Australian children on how they might contribute to our community. That's why I believe, my proposition please, that we need a national initiative to promote the resilience and well-being of children by offering them experiences of being contributors in their communities. One in which adults, particularly retired adults, would play a very important part. This might, just might, create the conditions for children in this land to want to remember those who've gone before, to cherish the living and to prepare for those not yet born. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy, very much. The next of our speakers is Dr. Lisa Gibbs. Dr. Lisa, uh, Lisa uh, is Associate Director within the Jack Brockhoff Child Health and Wellbeing Program. And she leads a whole range of studies which are fundamentally community partnership applied action research, engaging children, parents, communities, groups, stakeholders, policy makers, to really examine the social and environmental influences on child and family health and wellbeing. The spectrum of research is wide and diverse, and each one of her projects has incrementally contributed to the next one, really building a very established understanding of how you can work meaningfully with children, families, and communities in a cross-cultural and a culturally competent way. Her research focuses on engagement of marginalised or disadvantaged groups with an emphasis on community and policy outcomes achieved through this new university community government partnership approach. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks, Liz. Um, today I'm actually here to talk about children and disasters. But let me start by actually asking you a question. Can I ask you please to put up your hand, but only if you're comfortable, if any of you have experienced a disaster yourself? So if you've been in a bushfire, a flood, an earthquake or a cyclone or something similar, could you please put your hand up? Okay, and what about anyone who knows, who's had someone close to them involved in a disaster event? Can you please put your hand up? Okay, so we're now talking about the vast majority of the room. It's interesting, isn't it? We think of disasters as being a rare event, and yet the majority of people here have been closely connected to a disaster experience, which means that for children, it's not necessarily a rare event either. And yet the implications for children and young people are often overlooked. So thinking about the children in your lives, the children and young people who you really care about, if they were living in a bushfire risk area, for example, would you want them to be aware of the risk? Or would you rather protect them from that knowledge so that they don't become anxious? Would you like them to be involved in community planning and preparedness for a possible disaster? Or if a bushfire actually came through town, would you want them involved in the cleanup 
and the ongoing recovery activities, or would you rather than being kept separate from that, to protect them from the stark reality of a disaster impact? These are really tough questions, but they're real questions, and many parents had to deal with these issues when, they, when the Black Saturday fires came through Victoria in February 2009. They simply didn't know what is the best thing to do for our children. Now, my proposition for you today is not up there. <laughs> so I will tell you, it is that children and young people should be actively involved in disaster situations. Now, when I talk about disaster situations, I'm talking about planning and preparing for a possible disaster, responding to a disaster event as it happens, and the recovery in the days, weeks, months, and years afterwards. Probably before we deal with this proposition, we need to stop and think about how we perceive childhood. So I'd like to refer to three common theories of childhood. One is the notion of the child at risk, where we think of children as being vulnerable and passive victims in need of our protection. Another theory speaks of the developing child, where children are developing to become adults. But they're not there yet, and they're not capable of doing what we can do, so we tend to represent them and advocate for them. Another model is the notion of the citizen child, where we recognise that children actually are capable of making a meaningful contribution, and they have a right to do so. Now, those three different theories or models at face value, seem to be at odds with each other. But in actually, they're not necessarily, and they're encapsulated quite nicely in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which Larry referred to earlier, and to which, yes, Australia is a signatory. Now, it covers many things, and Larry did go through that in some detail, but there are three elements that I feel are relevant to my proposition, and that is the, the right for children to be kept safe. That's a fundamental one. But also the right for children to contribute to decisions that are affecting their lives. And when we engage with them, that we do it in a way that is appropriate to their skills and their level of maturity. And so that is how we can honour those three models of childhood. OK, now I've got to work out where I go from here. The question is, how do we do this in the context, the extreme context of disasters? And what about children who have already been traumatised by a disaster experience? Is it then appropriate to involve them as contributors or are they, do they need to be kept separate and safe? These are the issues we're dealing with as part of the Citizen-Child Collaboration, which is a collaboration I've formed with researchers here in Australia involved in bushfire and flood research, in New Zealand involved in earthquake research, and in Japan involved with earthquake and tsunami research. Now, obviously, we're not talking about children manning roadblocks or jumping on the CFA track to go and fight a fire. So let me give you some examples of how this might work. There's a lovely example in Jamaica that was reported by researchers, Morris and Edwards, where they actually had a, a course where they taught school students how to cook, but only using ingredients that would be available after a disaster. So food that didn't require refrigeration and had a long shelf life. Now you could just imagine here in Australia that taking off because cooking, let's face it, is a national obsession at the moment. And it may be a a great episode for MasterChef. So that's something that's operated in schools, but it can also work for families and communities. A father from one of the bushfire affected areas was telling me how he and his two teenage children were trapped on their property on Black Saturday as the fires approached. And his daughter was getting agitated, and so he gave her the job of keeping the horses calm. She spent a lot of time with her horses, so she understood that in order to keep them calm, she had to keep calm herself. And she managed to do that for the hours it took for them to defend their property against the fires. The teenage son was able to help the father in preparing the house and dealing with the fire because he used to drag them along to the neighbourhood fire guard meetings. They weren't keen, 
but clearly they managed to pick something up because between them they saved their own lives, their house and their horses. Another example is Marysville. Now, most of you will be aware that, that Marysville, a town here in Victoria, was completely devastated by the Black Saturday bushfires, including the kindergarten which burnt to the ground. It's right in the centre of town. Now, the new kindergarten has been rebuilt on another site with the school and the community health service. But at the time of thinking about rebuilding, the kindergarten committee were given the responsibility for what would, deciding what would happen with that site. And they were absolutely determined to involve the children in that process. And together they decided that this would be a great site for a playground. And they went to some trouble to engage a playground designer who was used to working with children in designing and planning the playground, and they did that. And while it was being built, the children were involved in creating beautiful artwork to embed within the playground and to express the experiences that they've had. Oh, I've completely. Thank you for your help. <laughs> Look, you can really see it's an absolutely beautiful space that they've created. And it's a lovely example of how very young children can be involved in a meaningful way in rebuilding activities that, are, that relate to them. But it got better than this because we're involved at the moment in bushfire recovery research and we're talking to people about their connection with their local community. A colleague and I were in Marysville recently talking to a man about his connection with his community and we take photos of the things they tell us about. And he showed us his house that has been rebuilt since the fires. That was one place that was very important to him. And the SES shed was a, an important part of his life. And he mentioned the Marysville town, the, the town centre. So we wandered down there and said, well, what is it about town that is important to you and what should we take a photo of? And he showed us the playground. And he was, I'm guessing, probably in his late 60s. So I said to him, oh, are you connected with some of the kids in the area? And he said, no, no, not really. And I said, oh, well, do you know who, who was behind the rebuild of this site? And he goes, oh, I'm not sure who was behind it. It was simply a place that made him feel good about his community. So I think it's a really important reminder that involving children and young people as contributors isn't just good for them. They make a really important contribution for everybody. So these are just a few examples of ways in which children and young people can make a meaningful and manageable contribution in disaster situations. Now, evidence is emerging internationally that when they're involved in that way, it has really positive outcomes for their mental health and well-being. And so I return now to my proposition that children and young people should have an active role in disaster situations. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Well, now it's time for me to bring the panel back up. And I'd like to introduce you to two new panel members who haven't spoken. The first one is Akram Azimi. In 2013, he was awarded the Young Australian of the Year. He's the Australian, Young Australian of the Year. He's a dedicated mentor to young Indigenous people. He arrived in Australia 13 years ago from Afghanistan and quickly went on to become an outstanding student. He's currently studying a triple major at the University of Western Australia. And in 2011, he co-founded a student-run initiative, I Am The Other, set up to raise awareness about Indigenous issues in universities. His philanthropic roles have included working with True Blue Dreaming, which helps disadvantaged remote Indigenous communities. So welcome, Akram, and it's great to have you here with us today. I have a second new person to introduce to you as well, Guillaume Nyakaboy. Guillaume was born in Eastern African state of Burundi. He and his family were forced to leave Burundi in 2000 and spent the next 10 years in a refugee camp in Tanzania. In 2010, he moved to Australia and now lives in the southeastern metropolitan region of Victoria. Since arriving in Victoria, Guillaume has volunteered with the Dandenong Youth Services Youth Leaders Program and has assisted in implementing three local youth-led projects. 
He's currently studying with Monash University and is passionate about human rights, promoting anti-discrimination and hopes to work specifically in child protection. And we're thrilled to have you here, Guillaume. So I'd now like to bring the rest of the panel up. And now it's over to you and your questions. We've got roving mics that go around. And please wait till the mic is on before you speak. But it's your opportunity to field any questions or to uh, represent any questions that you've seen come through on Twitter. Um, Catherine asks, is a sense of purpose and contribution perhaps just as necessary as a sense of belonging for the well-being of young adults? Dorothy, off you go. Others may wish to speak from experience, but I'm speaking from the research. And it would, uh, the three characteristics of resilient children, children brought up in great adversity, but for whom the outcomes in terms of employment, education, the avoidance of incarceration, those type of outcomes are much, much better than for other children exposed to the same adversity, are first and foremost, um, a personal temperament that evokes positive responses from others. Secondly, no separations from their mother in the first year of life, and that's the foundation stone for the belonging, the attachment. Um, and thirdly, required helpfulness, doing something for others. And that's, I think, the being the contributor. So I think it's equally belonging and being a contributor. Unless you belong, you might not have the same sense of the importance of what you're contributing to, as did the adolescents during the Great Depression. They were contributing to the family unit to which they belonged, and that was the source of their efficacy and the resilience. I think, so, from an Aboriginal perspective, we have both contemporary and historical um, policies and practices, we have ongoing impacts that are associated with the way that Aboriginal people were controlled in Australia, for example, where, you know, if you say something often enough that we are useless, that we are not able to be educated or employed, that, um, that our culture is of no value, then we've actually found that generationally we've come to believe that in many instances, unfortunately. And so um, the perceived and the real ability for us to be able to contribute more broadly, I think, has been inhibited or suppressed or oppressed in many ways. And for a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mob, they're only just moving out of that mindset. And not only within our own communities, but the social perceptions and the public opinion of what we can do and what we can be has very much you know, controlled where we've been able to move, whether we're academics or clinicians or lawyers, whether we're teachers, whether we're great parents, how we actually um, interact with the community and so I think that's actually perpetuated all of those negative stereotypes and has not I suppose not not allowed us because only we can allow people to take that power from us but if you're told something often enough and you layer on that something that we talked about around say lateral violence and us attacking each other for example so we need to move beyond that and to mature and to stand up and to have voice um, and what we are able to contribute isn't just about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues. It's about what we contribute to this country and what a rich history that is. We are the oldest continuous culture on the face of the earth. What is not to be proud of? And when I was much smaller, much younger, many, many years ago, my father said to me, and, and as an Aboriginal man, you, you are Aboriginal and that doesn't make you better or worse than anybody else, but it makes you special. And I think that's been at the very heart of allowing me to, to do the things that I have done. And I think that's been really important. Just, just to add to that, absolutely. Um, the the organisation that um, uh, I'm working with at the moment, I'm the other. This was an initiative founded by Indigenous and non-Indigenous students at university. We thought that was really, really important that we came together and we did it together. We spoke in one voice. And our, our, our approach is, what if we address Indigenous health outcomes by changing social perceptions amongst non-Indigenous Australians? What if, what if the way and some of the perceptions, and often very uh, misinformed perceptions and profoundly ignorant, and I'm, I count myself in that group. What if we change those perceptions? What if we let go of some of those prejudices? Um, I, I have an anthropology background and a human biology background, and bring those two things together. Uh, we won't have time for it today, but 
I can make a powerful argument that social discrimination, just the disrespectful look, is just as bad at a physiological level as taking a baseball bat and hitting somebody. Um, do we go around assaulting people? No, we don't, because it's really expensive. It's really, really expensive. There's profound consequences. Uh, you need to go to the hospital. You don't need to have medical care. Yet, we don't seem to have the same kind of thinking when it comes to social discrimination, the consequences of that, and how much we could actually save by letting go of some of those prejudices. And putting aside the moral cost, we as a taxpayer, this is a non-Indigenous Australia, we would save ourselves so much money if we just let go of our prejudice. We would live, in, it's cheaper to live in a more just society. It's in our economic interest to regard Indigenous Australians as human beings of equal worth to ourselves. Not better, not worse, human beings of equal worth with inherent dignity just like us. If we did that tomorrow, we would save ourselves a lot of money. <laughs> And it's the right thing to do, but we'll save ourselves lots of money. You know, I think what we're hearing is that there are three things that are essential to uh, the development of a child. One is contribution, another is belonging. I don't think you can say one is more important than the other. But the third, um, what our, my two wonderful colleagues have said, is self-worth, um, the se dignity. Um, I often tell my students who are you know, have been privileged all their lives. And I say, you know, every single day that you grow up, your parents told you how beautiful and handsome and smart and talented and wh how you could go far. And that's, that's your life experience. Um, but if you think of others, uh, and every moment is the opposite. Every moment is an indignity. Um, the look. Um, President Obama talked about it um, in, just in terms of an African-American man. As even, even somebody as accomplished as him, the look that he was stealing something, um, that he was doing something. It's these subtle cues of indignity that make all of the difference. And so you just have to do a thought experiment. And if you think to yourself, even if you've had all this wonderful affirmation, and you think of one time in your life where you suffered an indignity, you feel it in there. And now imagine somebody who's felt, who's had that same experience reinforced time and time and time again, and you can begin to understand it. Uh, you go, you go. Uh, one of the, <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, one of the things that uh, I come from uh, a very humble ground. I was, as they said before, I was born in, uh, in Burundi. Over there, we have uh, the way we view young people is quite different from the way uh, most people view young people. But most of the thing, ha most of the point has been made. But what I want to say is that uh, young people being contributed to the society is actually one thing which is really important in their development. Uh, I take to myself uh, when I was in grade eight. I was uh, able to volunteer to one of organizations called Right to Play. Uh, doing that actually has helped me to shape who I am, uh, had helped me to understand my belonging and my identity, as they were saying. So it's giving the opportunity to young people is really crucial to their development. Mm -hmm. No matter, something which I've seen is also, it doesn't matter of where you are, or it doesn't really matter of where you live or who you are. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is important, just having the will of being a contributor to the society. That's what gives you your true identity, your true belonging. Uh, I agree. I, just very, very quickly. Um, I've been incredibly lucky as a young Australian of the year to go to over 150 different schools this year from every, every corner of Australia. And I've noticed there's, a, there's, there's two different cultures um, in schools. And this normally doesn't align with material prosperity, although it seems to. There's certain schools when you walk in and there's this buzz, there's this energy about the place. And then there's some other schools where people are just trying to hold things together. And the difference I found, although there was a mild correlation with material prosperity, was something else. Uh, in the former schools, in the really thriving schools, students were constantly being asked to care for their community. Constantly being asked. Because implicit in that question is, you have something of value to give. Mm -hmm. And implicit underneath that is, you are valuable yourself. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the other schools, in the school that I went to, 
um, we were never asked that. And you assume in that silence that you have nothing to contribute. In fact, then you feel like a burden. You feel like a burden on society. You are valueless yourself. The only difference between myself and I was one of two students that made it out of that school and made it to university. The difference between myself and the other students wasn't that I was more brighter. Honestly, wasn't. It was because I had an amazing teacher that not only gave me things, but he also gave me an opportunity to give back. And when you give back to somebody, the byproduct of that is self-worth because we generate what I call community esteem. And the byproduct of that is self-esteem. And when opportunities came my way, I saw the worth of this opportunity here and my own self-worth here. And I just grabbed it and just ran with both, with, with both legs and just said, this is mine, I'm gonna take it. Most people in that school didn't take the opportunities. In fact, I do know of one scholarship that came up and only I took it. Because instead of feeling excitement, I know now, looking back, what those other students felt was shame. Because the worth of the opportunity was up here and their own perceived self-worth was down here. And instead of being excited and grabbing that opportunity, they felt shame. I'm not worthy of this opportunity before me. And just to, just to uh, finish off my thought here, it was in the process of being of service to this community, to my school, uh, to these students who had previously been quite mean to me. Some of them had been very, very mean to me. Suddenly it changed everything because suddenly I was the one who had the loci of control. Uh, I know that's a psychological term for some of you here. I'll put another word. I realized I had some control, some autonomy in my life. Because when you're at the receiving end, you are profoundly, profoundly powerless. Because you're always at the mercy of other people's whim. But the moment you step up and you're of service to your community, you choose who you serve. You choose how you serve. And suddenly you realize, I have something within myself. You come to understand that autonomy. And in that process of being of service to a community, you generate community itself. And I define belonging as that process where a place feels like a person and a person feels like a place. The oscillation of subject and object. And it's in that oscillation. What drives that oscillation, I profoundly believe, is service. I mean, we belong to our mum. My mum, I belong to my mum, uh, first and foremost. Not only because she gave me 50% of her DNA in rent for nine months, uh, free rent for nine months, but because she's been of profound service to me. I belong to her because she's been of profound service to me. We belong to one another, and we belong to those who have served us, and we have served. I'm not quite sure how the Twitter uh, sender of the message will capture all of the richness that came back then. But thank you. Fiona's got the microphone, and then middle up the back. I can see why you're Australian of the Year. Um, I th um, it was a fantastic session. Thank you. I feel full of positive vibes. I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt, my heroine, who said, no one makes me feel uh, inferior without my permission. Um, and no, that's just exactly how you've come across. Um, I just want to ask um, the panel, though, um, a lot of the way, I'm an epidemiologist, a lot of the way we measure health and well-being is in the negative. We measure it in death rates. We measure mental ill health, not mental health. We measure poor being instead of well-being. How much do you think that affects and influences our ability to take this more positive um, uh, participation, uh, contributing, belonging, uh, self-worth, a resilience kind of message that you've given us so strongly? Um, Fiona, I think that's a really important point and I think we have to be very careful of the measures we use in research as well as the, the approach to any interventions or programs. Um, we had an experience many years ago with an obesity prevention study and there was a, we wanted a quality of life measure. And, um, and I was out interviewing these young children, oh, I think they were grade three, they were little you know, and the series of questions that was designed very nicely. The child just had to point to the happy face, the sad face or the neutral face. But the questions, so many of them were negative and, and I had this little girl sort of come in and sit in front of me and the questions were things like, do your, do your friends tease you? And she's like, hmm, yes. And, you know, can you keep up with your friends? Oh, no. And, and, and by the end of this measure, which was mostly negative, 
I started to put in some of my own. <laughs> Do you like playing outside? <laughs> to get her smile again. I was really concerned that by the time she left the room, I was going to leave her in a state of despair. And I think the reality with some of the statistical modelling of these measures is that the negative questions are more sensitive to difference. And they're often the ones left in the measure, the short versions. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as researchers, we have to be very careful and thoughtful about what we use. Uh, I, sorry. Go. Oh, yeah, on, darling, I'll go after you. <laughs> <laughs> You're gorgeous. Um, I would agree in, um, for example, in measuring social support in the mental health literature, unlike what an anthropologist would say, which is to look at reciprocity, not only what might others do for you, but what you for others, most of the instruments for measuring social support are how many people do you see and who would help you if you needed it alone, who would help you if you were sick, who looks so that they're very individualistic, which of course reflects a very individualistic culture. Um, but also our services and the ones I mentioned, child and adolescent mental health, child protection, juvenile justice, the frameworks of psychosocial assessment, with some exceptions, are very deficit based. And you know, only in recent times have we seen a move to a more strength based framework for actually trying to come to an understanding of this child, this family, this young person in a more positive way. And interesting, and I'm glad I'm going to let you go first, darling, because it sort of leads on, it's a little bit tangential, but bear with me. So we're finding that if the language or the process isn't working for us, then we're looking at ways of changing that process or changing the language. So for me, I think the social determinants of health have a bit of that sort of deficit approach to it. So if you're not educated, if you haven't been to school or if you're not employed, you're not connected socially, then all of your outcomes are much poorer than for someone who is. But if we talk about a cultural determinants approach, it's about all of the positive and strength-based approaches that we're able to utilise, say, within an Indigenous perspective but obviously from other cultures as well because it's about connection it's about knowing and belonging and feeling that you have a sense of place and taking all of that wonderfully rich history and, and taking that forward and providing a, a foundation for more positive outcomes if that makes sense we're also changing the language around the social uh, social and emotional well-being and so we've tucked in there social emotional and cultural well-being so, you know, you could be, for example, um, diagnosed with a chronic disease, but you could feel well and have a certain sense of well-being otherwise, but you've been labelled with a particular disease or a, a particular, um, you know, been put in a particular box. So it doesn't mean that you're not well, and that's particularly true for Aboriginal mob. So, you know, our rates of, um, of chronic disease and our health outcomes, you know, we, we show the greatest disparities for anything that we care to measure. Are we measuring it the right way and are we looking at the right things because if you then ask them about their self-reported health and outcomes and their sense of well-being they'd probably say look I'm doing okay thank you very much so you know are we capturing that so if we don't like the tool perhaps we change the tool if we don't like the language we use our own language hi, hi. Um, I'd like to start off with Professor Scott my name's um, Danny Shavitsky Max says hi. Um, Danny, could you use the mic? Sorry, uh, hi, my name's Danny Shavitsky. Sorry, hi, Mike. Um, yeah, um, look, two things. I've worked in child protection, youth justice, and as a teacher. So first question I will directly with child protection regarding leaving care. Um, we're asking an 18-year-old to become self-sufficient economically, to find supported accommodation, to do his or own cooking, to find education, employment. Um, so the first question is, should we be looking at increasing the leaving care, the state to take responsibility for a young person until they're 21 or 25? Secondly, the question about supporting staff. I was working as a support worker at a unit with a high risk adolescent who was a disability client and the staff quite readily said they're controlling that young person by the use of fear, and that was totally wrong. So can you sort of deal with those issues, please? Thanks, Danny. Um, well, this is the group of young people who've been in state care, and, and I might add that o over 30,000 children tonight across this land will be in state care, and that is double that of a decade ago, with Indigenous children 10 times overrepresented in that statistic. So let's put that in the national context. And these are some of the most vulnerable young people in our whole country. And we relinquish them into 
a wider community at a far younger age than we would children in our own families. So many of us have pushed for and quite successfully to increase the age um, so that the state has a continuing obligation to support our young people to 21 or in one jurisdiction even 25. How well that is fulfilled though is a serious concern. I would also say that even in that very disadvantaged subgroup of young people, there is the capacity for young people to be contributors. And I'm thinking of a young man I mentored through the CREATE Foundation, which is the self-help group for young people um, who've left care. And while I was mentoring him as he was doing social work at RMIT, he was mentoring a very behaviourally disturbed 10-year-old in a residential care unit, the sort of environment you're describing. And every time we met, the young man I was mentoring spoke mostly about the 10-year-old boy. And I'm sure, I'm sure that it was his mentoring of the 10-year-old boy, more than my mentoring of him, that was responsible for the outcome he's gone on to be a family therapist, a social worker, and um, so I think that even these very, very vulnerable young people have something to give and that we can find what it is that they enjoy giving, whether it's caring for an animal or teaching a skill to another young person or whatever, and, and that's where we need to focus some of our attention. Um, something which I just want to add on what Professor Doth was saying, every young person have the ability to give something to the community. As I said before, it doesn't really matter of what is your background, you can still give something to, to the community. I always, give my, I always look at myself where I come from, getting to Australia, I did not know that I would be able to give something to the community, but I did. Uh, getting to Australia, I was able to participate in some youth project, I mean, helping other young people, even though I was helping myself. Something which I, I always look at is, if I help someone, I'm actually helping myself. At the moment, I sometimes tutor chemistry. When I'm, when I'm tutoring someone chemistry, I'm actually tutoring myself that, that same topic. Uh, uh, when he asked me a question on that topic, mm -hmm. he made me think, and when I think about it, I broaden my understanding on that topic. So helping someone, contributing to the community, no matter where you come from, does really help you as well. As she was giving an example of uh, the person that you were mentor mentoring, you know, mentoring that person, that person was actually mentoring another person. So being mentoring another person actually helped him to achieve and to get where he was able to get. So yeah, it does really help. Thank you. Up the back on the, my left hand side. Thank you very much. My first comment is congratulations and thank you for the festival. Uh, I think it's a really important statement about what's important uh, and brings together uh, the work of so many people who are, are contributing to this uh, and I think that is, uh, that's, a, that's one of the, my first message. Uh, My second message is, or well, second comment is based on a, a premise that at the inaugural Communities and Control Conference, Professor Fiona Stanley uh, made as her premise, it takes a village to raise a child, and then expanded on that in, in quite some detail in a very rich way. Uh, but one of the things that I, I've noticed is that uh, writers like Hugh McKay, Richard Eckersley, and many others have talked about the fact that in the last 50 years, uh, we have been in an entrenched transition, socially, politically, economically, and every other way. And we know that the research on transition talks about self-doubt, uncertainty, uh, withdrawing into ourselves, and so on and so forth. Now, if we're going to talk about the village, who is the village? And it's the families, it's the community, uh, and, and those kinds of things. But Hugh McKay talks about the fact that families have undergone an enormous restructure in the last 50 years. With, a, uh, there's been, with an increase in uh, insecurity of employment, of relationships, of self, and all of those kinds of things. So if, the, if, the, if that's the village, 
and the village is struggling with itself, then we, we need to try and take, put that into the equation and deal with it in some um, prospective way. Uh, the other comment I would make is that uh, the, uh, much of the framework for dealing with this, and particularly more recently, and across a number of nations across the world, is not so much to talk about health, but to go to the, the, the elections with a large banner for law and order rather than uh, a much more positive, constructive approach uh, that will actually give people hope. Because if the village doesn't operate uh, in a coherent way, it's going to undo itself. Thank you. I know it was a comment, but would anyone like to respond at all or sure, I'll, contribute? I'll, I'll come at it from a, a slightly um, unique angle. Uh, and the story begins about 1.8 million years ago. Um, <laughs> 1.8 million years ago, there would have been a woman. And for the first time in the history of the universe, she would have had this neurological mutation in her brain that would have given her this strange capacity to look at somebody and go, you're going to be OK. You're OK. You would help my baby. And for the first time, with some accuracy, give that baby to that person and say, I'm going to go and I'm going to collect some berries. I'm going to get some nuts. I'm going to feed myself. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to have enough for all of us. That was the first time that had ever happened. You see, before this, the hominin line, the mothers were not only hyper-vigilant, they were also hyper-possessive. If you see a gorilla monkey walking around, <coughs> the gorilla mum walking around, she'll always have her baby strapped to her back. They are hyper-possessive. Yet we, for some strange reason, came to the conclusion that we, uh, it takes a village to raise a child. The reason this happened was because 1.8 million years ago, we developed the capacity for theory of mind. And this capacity for theory of mind allowed us to do what's called alloparenting, which is to say, you take care of the baby, I'm going to go and collect some nuts. So suddenly mothers could predict with some accuracy if someone was going to help or harm their baby. And then what started happening is this mutation just took off. The ability to read another human being's mind, my God, what a fantastic asset, right? And this revolutionized everything. And this is part of the reason why we have such a fantastically large uh, cerebral cortex, particularly frontal lobe. And it's really designed to understand other human beings. That is why we're so vulnerable to social cues of disrespect, because the brain is not designed to pick up the weather, not designed to scale up mountains. It's designed to know how you regard me like that. I can look into this audience and tiny little micro expressions, I know exactly how you regard me. And I then give myself a value with respect to that because there's constantly this reflexive process. Now you said it takes a village to raise a child. Absolutely. But what that village needs is it needs leaders. And what it needs that leaders to do is to desaturate the fear out of the environment. That's, that's what's needed. We can go back can go back to uh, allo parenting. We can go back to that village raising the children. I mean, when I'm in Luma, the kids, they, they just run around free. They really do. Everybody's family. Kids are looked after by everybody. It's this beautiful, inclusive environment. And some of those beautiful kids, when we walked into there, those kids were super giving, super loving. It was OK for them. They weren't afraid of strangers. In fact, we were kind of exciting. Well, then, you know, the, the wet season had just ended. And they're like, come on in. And then they started showing us around. And they were profoundly generous. And I went, wow. This is because of the fact that you were raised by so many different people. You consider so many different people family. And then slowly they incorporated us into the family. The thing that made all of that happen was the women in that community, the elderly women. They are the matriarchs, created a very, very safe environment. They create a safe environment for people to come together. This fragmentization that we have in our society of the family, of the extended family, it just wasn't there because these women were holding everybody together. So for me, so just, what a village needs is more matriarchs. Kyrie. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Kathy left? <laughs> my, my response is a little bit less intellectual, so please forgive me. But I mean, socially and culturally, we are a collective. And historically, say, for Aboriginal mob, we've been deconstructed as a village or as a culture or as a collective. And unfortunately, I, I find, and you know, the conspiracy theorist in me says that politically, you know, in terms of policy and social practice, that it's all about individual gain and individual benefit. And this isn't just a dom domestic phenomenon, it's, you know, it's globally. He who dies with the most toys wins. So how do we then, as a social movement, come back to the strength in numbers? How do we get back to being that collective? That's what I, and another reason why, 
Now, cultural constructs are so important because not just for Aboriginal mob, but for every other community on the face of the earth, we were a village and we were a collective. So how do we come back to that? And just in terms of, you know, what we're doing currently, uh, you know, the recent campaign that was very much about the divide and conquer, I'm ashamed. So, you know, how do we then stop that rot? Larry? Well, my, my field is, is public health and I wrote a, bio, and a bio, autobiographical article called From a Civil Libertarian to a Sanitarian because I began my life very much as a civil, civil liberties and I believe that you know, rights, autonomy, privacy was the salient, salient importance. And the truth is, is that a lot of Western societies have grabbed on to that very individualistic role, none, none more destructively than my own society. But I think it's also true in, in, many, in many other places. Uh, and so I do think you're right. I do think that we're, we're individuals were embedded in communities. That's really very important. And one of the things that I thought of was that in my neighborhood, it's very safe. All the children are out, they're playing basketball and everything. And if you go to another community, they're all, they're afraid, they're indoors. And you know, what's the responsibility for that? Part of it is security. I think the best definition of public health is we as a society to create the conditions in which all of us can be healthy and safe, which is really, I think, critically, critically important. So what's the role of government? So government's role is to create, help free the community to do this. It's to create safety, first of all, so that they can go out and play. Parks, bicycle paths, walking paths, uh, play, just places where you can do things. I, I, once, I, told, I tell a story about public health that you can you can tell a mother, you know, feed your, in an individualistic way, feed your child well and have that child get physical activity, which is what the public health people say. But if the mother knows that if she sends the child outdoors to play, that there are no playgrounds and it's dark and it's unsafe, then, that, then she can't do that. And if there's no, if she can't afford them, there's no access to fresh fruits and vegetables and things like that. She can't do that. So there's a role for government and society to create those conditions in which communities can be communities and not individuals. Okay. Probably got time for about two more. Uh, someone has already got the mic. That answers that question. <laughs> um, hi, my name's Trish Cave. I'm from Raising Children Network. So we um, empower, we are a government funded and we um, empower parents with uh, research-based information. And um, so I really wanted to hear how you can um, uh, ask parents or adults to be role models as opposed to leaders. Um, I think when we ask people to be leaders, sometimes we ask too much um, because they think they have to be magnificent and um, rather than just be who they are. So and I want to point really to a personal thing, Lisa. Um, thank you for sharing the um, Marysville um, story with us because um, that's a very personal story to me. I actually put the landscape um, playground designer in touch with the kinship um, kinder, yes, and he did. And part of the story that I want to say is that it was the mothers who um, put the children there and um, in every way. So um, I just wanted to ask what, why I wanted to mention that is those women were such amazing role models as opposed to leaders. And when we ask people to step way up above what they think they can do, they don't do it. And so I'd love to hear um, how adults can be role models. Well, I think some of our best services, for example, thinking about the government role, already do this. Um, maternal and child health nurses, for example, in this state, 98% of, ch of children are connected with maternal and child health service. Two thirds of all first time mothers, sometimes first time parents, but it's mainly mothers, join first time parent groups. Um, I've done research on that, followed them up two years later, 
80% of them have become self-sustaining social networks that the nurse facilitated usually for eight sessions. So we can take our services, health, schools as community centres, the sort of schools you felt that atmosphere in, those schools are the nucleus of their communities. Some schools aren't. So I think in health, in education, and in other parts of government-funded services, we can strengthen social capital. And, and uh, that is central to all that we've been talking about. There's some great things happening. Would anyone else like to contribute? And then we have to call for the vote. Or Mike's in charge, you can. <laughs> okay, Lisa. Oh, look, I have to respond. <laughs> I think it's also important to, to think on those on the smaller scale and, and celebrate those great examples because I agree that sometimes we talk about how important it is to this and, and important it is to do that and everyone thinks, yes, people should do that. But those sorts of stories are really nice ways of, of providing an example where people can relate to it and think, well, actually, I could do that. I could start with that. And, and if I start at that small level, nobody's going to expect me to take it further, but it might. And um, so I think part of it is about sharing the stories. Have we got time? One tweet. One From you. Thank you very much. Um, Firstly, um, I'd just like to relate to you all how, uh, how much you're feeling the love from the Twitter feed at the moment. Um, we also have uh, Lucy Westerman at home. Uh, she's saying, thank goodness for live streaming of FOI events. Home with my children on holidays today, but tuned in and I'm captivated. So we, we have a lot more people watching that you're probably perceiving. Um, there's also a tweet asking, they say it takes a village to raise a child, but who in particular is the village? I think that relates to part of the it comment does. and question yeah. that came before. I think that's a fantastic one to finish mm. on. So who would like to go first? Who's the village? Lisa. I'll, I'll comment very briefly to allow others. I think um, th there's two things I'd say in response to that. One is that the village is often self-defining. It's do people feel like they belong. And also I think that it's, it's a notion that's shifting with the onset of, of technology. We have many online villages now, as well as locational and interest-based. I'd just make one quick comment and say that Robert Putnam would say that we just don't need bonding social capital, villages of people like ourselves, mm. class, ethnicity, religion, that if we're to thrive as a society, we need bridging social capital. Yeah. So we need villages that are based on diversity yes. and we're building villages across those differences. This nation is really at a turning point yeah. in relation to that. Could I just add? Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Um, uh, villages are places where leaders in, in that space make a legitimate public space for people's differences. They desaturate fear out of that context and they equally distribute dignity and respect. Thank you, Akram. Nairi? Well, this is a bit sort of philosophical, but I am. And if everybody said I am, then we'll, we'll have that foundation upon which to then enact all of these things. I think it's a beautiful way to end. Mm. I'm now going to ask you all to turn on your mobile phones or re-energise your mobile phones <laughs> without it becoming a disorder. Um, and we are getting ready to vote. So the mobile phone number that you need to pop in in terms of preparing to vote is up here on the screen. And what we also have are the propositions that were raised by each of our presenting <coughs> panel members. And this is your time to vote. You just put in the number that relates to each of the propositions. And then we'll gradually see an accumulation of of the voting on the screen. Oh my goodness, look at that. Oh, it's only one of each. <laughs> okay, does anyone want me to read them out or can... Shall I read them out? So the first one is we must rationalise child protection legislation nationally and in the territories and that was from Nairi Brown. The government should increase international assistance to ensure that every child in the region has the human right of and a fair opportunity for a healthy lifespan, from Larry Goston. 
We need a national initiative to promote the resilience and well-being of children by offering them experiences of being contributors in their communities. Dorothy Scott. And children and young people should be given an active role in disaster situations by Lisa Gibbs. So different. I could do, we haven't done a vote by hands, but we could certainly do a vote by hands in addition. Can we, Mike? Are we allowed to do that? <laughs> Everyone wants them all. Let's get a show of hands of who votes for all of them. I vote for all of them. Well, we might bring the afternoon to a close as you're voting. I think I would like Fiona to come up. Uh, together, Fiona and I have worked with all the panels today to uh, try and bring it to the day, if you like. And um, it's a great testament to Fiona's leadership and her profile and her energy and her empathy uh, that we have had a day that sounds daggy to some, but has been one of the richest days in the entire Festival of Ideas. So thank you, Fiona, and over to you. No, thank you so much. For, uh... <laughs> thank you so much for participating. In, in, a, in a way, this was my sort of pet day of the festival. Um, uh, I guess my whole sort of life has been dedicated to the health and well-being of children and getting uh, communities and, and uh, the governments and so on to, to, to put that on the agenda. I know Anne Sanson's here and Anne and I helped set up uh, with Dorothy, the Australian Research Alliance for Children and Youth, just because of, we felt Australia was neglecting its children and young people. But you know, when we've got these people here, and now I'm still going to count you as young now, even though you're a mum and all, <laughs> uh, you just feel as though we're going to be okay. But they're only go we're only going to be okay if we encourage these points of view and discourage those other points of view which are very negative to building the kind of community capacity that's going to make our country really great. And it is about investing in the future that Dorothy said, where you, you take notice. And even as the First Nations in Canada do, thinking seven generations ahead as they plan their current thinking. So we've got to do that. We, the sort of, I, I, I sort of hesitate to say, but the elite thinkers of this nation who are here at this festival, we are elite and we do have power and a lot has come out from the festival of the kinds of things that can come from people power. So I don't want you to enjoy these sessions. I want you to be so empowered by them that you go out and do something. And there are a lot of examples today of what you can do, lots of them from this morning session right through to this one this afternoon. But all I am just so happy and relieved, Mike, we done it. <laughs> and this is what it's all about. So thank you. Thank you. Before you go, for those of you who'd like to come to the next session, which is down at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre, there is a bus that will be leaving from the festival desk, or actually it'll be leaving from the street, but if you go up to the festival desk on the next floor up, they'll be leaving from 4.30. Um, I would like to thank all of our panel in particular for a fantastic session. And we're very privileged today to have Vic Health and the Queen Victoria Women's uh, Centre as our sponsors for the day. So thank you to them both as well. Thanks very much.